Okay, hello. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the second in the IUCN Red List webinar series. And um, thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, I can see there's still people joining the session right now as I'm speaking. So um, please note that these webinars are recorded, so they will be posted on the IUCN Red List website within the next few weeks. Uh, I'm Caroline Pollock. I'm the Senior Programme Coordinator for the IUCN Red List Unit based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and one of the main roles of the Red List Unit is to manage and update the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Um, and part of that role involves providing feedback and support to all of you um, Red List assessors from the SSC network and other people involved in Red List projects um, just to make sure that you, you are provided with enough support to um, um, keep doing Red List assessments. Now, we, we understand that all of you put in a lot of effort and a lot of your time into Red List assessments, and it's our role to provide as much support and help to make that process as easy as possible for you. So the whole purpose of these webinars is to provide a vehicle to do that. So not only are you invited into the webinars, we're recording them and we will make them available for, for people to use on the website at any time. So in this webinar, we are going to focus on a task that many people find quite daunting, um, preparing distribution maps. Now, for those of us who um, were not introduced to GIS software in our academic years, including myself, um, the requirement to provide a distribution map with Red List assessments can be quite a challenge. Um, but actually over the last decade, 10, 10 or 15 years or so, more and more tools have become available online to help you do this. So there's lots of software out there, but how do you use it? That is the big question. And that's what we're going to focus on today. I'm sure all of you recognize that um, there's a huge value in having distribution data available for Red List assessments. Um, so having that species distribution of uh, data available provides a huge amount of an analytical power. But not all of you want to be GIS experts. You might not want to be, or you might not have the time available. But fortunately, these GIS tools that are available can help you to um, prepare the basic distribution maps without ha having to be an expert. So you don't have to go on a long involved course. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And um, our speaker today is uh, Clay Meredith from uh, the New Mexico Biopark Society. So Clay is the Species Survival Officer for Plants at the Biopark Society. Um, and Clay is going to take you through some of the useful data sources available for mapping, um, some of the tools available for helping you to calculate certain parameters for red listing using a distribution map. So things like calculating extent of occurrence, um, some of the various GIS platforms are out there that you can use to prepare basic distribution maps and how to avoid some of the common mistakes that you um, people commonly fall into when doing mapping. So um, this is a very informal webinar and um, we invite you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to do that. And we're very fortunate to have Anna Walker joining us, who's also from New Mexico Biopark Society. Um, Anna will be helping to answer questions as we go along through the webinar and some of those questions we might open up for Clay to talk about and to answer during the actual webinar itself. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to Clay. So thanks for doing this, Clay, and it's over to you. As Carolyn mentioned, we're going to kind of mention, uh, we're going to go through some platforms that are available. Um, I'm really going to touch on more of the GIS side of things so that we can discuss how you can get the training and the information you need to know um, to make a map. So we're going to go over the, the very basics of what you need to know um, to, to learn more and to learn what you need to make a map. Um, yeah, GIS is a really broad subject. It's a really complicated field. Um, and, and teaching you how to use every platform in 90 minutes is far beyond my capabilities. Um, but what we really like to do is make sure that you have the tools to um, make the maps that you need and you know where to find the resources that are going to help you make those. Um, so let's get started. Um, uh, as we go on, please, please drop in any questions you've got in the chat. We've built in lots and lots of time for questions with the hope that um, we can get some feedback from you and get a better understanding of what your needs are. 
um, and answer some specific questions to make sure that, um, that, that you're getting the resources that you need. Um, so uh, maps are now required supporting information for uh, assessments submitted to the Red List unit. Um, they're a key component of all IUCN Red List assessments. Um, and they're required for nearly all submitted assessments. Uh, the exception to this is for species listed as data deficient, for which distribution is unknown. Um, so if a species is known only from a type specimen with no associated location data, uh, perhaps it's from a market or, or some other uh, place removed from its natural habitat. Um, we may also have genetic data suggesting that there is a species, but we don't know precisely where it occurs. Um, in those instances, a map is not required. But aside from that, if your species is not listed data deficient, a map is required. Um, maps are a required component because they provide a means for basic analysis. Um, they Researchers can download a compendium of maps from the IUCN and get a better understanding of where threatened species occur. Um, and it's really important when creating these maps or analyzing spatial data to understand the purpose of the map. Um, fortunately, the Red List unit has some, some very clear guidelines, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in detail. Um, maps can be generated in a, in a variety of platforms and formats and submitted to the Red List unit in several ways. Um, if you need more information on how to submit them, uh, please, please consult the, the Red, List trainer, uh, Red, List, Red List Assessor Trainer documents. Um, there's some really good information on how to submit uh, maps. Otherwise, um, contact the Red List unit and, and they can walk you through the process and find a solution that works for, for you. Um, I want to start by really emphasizing the mapping guidelines and resources documentation available on the Red List. Um, more information on standards for mapping can be found on the Red List website specifically in this document. The mapping standards and data quality document has, um, this should be the first document that you consult with any questions about mapping. Um, it has detailed information on uh, how to code in the presence and occurrence fields, how to code in all of the attribute table fields for that matter, um, and what the purpose of the map is. So this provides some philosophical guidelines about why we're mapping and what we're mapping. Um, I really, really wanna reiterate one component of this document, which is the purpose of maps. Um, the maps created for uh, to accompany Red List assessments um, are intended to be field guide maps. Um, they depict the range of a species and where it occurs, um, but they don't necessarily imply that the, uh, the species is equally distributed within that range or that the species occurs in all of that range in, in its entirety. There may be gaps or areas where the species doesn't occur, um, that are depicted on the range. The goal here is to make sure that all occurrences of the species are within that map um, and within that map's distribution. Um, so knowing that, it gives you kind of an idea of where to source your data and how to, to build your data. And it's something you should keep in mind as you're making your maps. Um, that said, this document doesn't really have a lot of information on how to translate these guidelines into a map using GIS software. And that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, so, move some things around. There we go. Um, uh, since a, a full GIS course is outside the scope of this webinar, um, I'll be focusing on some basic terminology to help you get started um, and, and help you look for additional help and training. Um, there's a, an enormous variety of resources available for GIS training, uh, and we'll direct you to some of these tonight, uh, this morning with some. Uh, Anna will be dropping in some links to training resources. Um, we'll discuss how you can uh, learn to use these GIS software packages effectively without really having an intensive training course. Um, making maps for the Red List is a relatively simple application of GIS software, um, and you should be able to pick it up pretty easily. Most people can learn how to make a map within an afternoon without too much trouble at all. Um, Investing that little bit of time in learning how to use these softwares would be really, really, really helpful to you. And, and we're gonna help you choose which software package to use. Um, these resources will assess you in the technical aspects of mapping, but maybe not precisely with the, um, uh, the taxonomic groups that you work with specifically. Um, so for those questions, you might wanna reach out to your relevant specialist group and ask them you know, what your requirements are, how they do certain things, because that's gonna differ from group to group. Um, today, we're gonna to lay out the basics for you though to, to give you a better understanding of how to get started. 
Um, so first, I want to demystify GIS a little bit. It's a it's a field that's um, often referred to by this acronym, and and often people don't realize what that acronym means. Um, it seems very complex and and uh, difficult to understand for a layperson. And often, if you're not a specialist, it becomes um, a, a daunting prospect to learn how to use it. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Um, and they are uh, best understood if you look at the really early applications. These are kind of paper maps that were made in the 19th century, um, which are the development of GIS as a field. Uh, the two earliest applications are depicted here at the top of the screen. Um, they were by Charles Piquet in uh, Paris and John Snow in London. Both were studying the incidents of cholera in an attempt to address outbreaks in their respective cities. Um, and uh, they examined uh, cholera incidents and density in different ways. So Piquet uh, examined the number of uh, cholera cases in each of Paris's district and created a rudimentary heat map that you see here on the right. Um, that was in 1834. Uh, John Snow famously created the map on the left in 1854. Uh, he mapped the incidence of cholera as a bar graph overlaid onto a map of the Soho neighborhood in London. Relaying this information and, and relying on this data, uh, he identified a single well as the source of the outbreak, removed the pump handle, and miraculously, the cholera outbreak stopped. Um, what this uh, goes to show is what a GIS is composed of. And it's really a simple, um, uh, it, it's a it's a simple uh, tool that can help you uh, make decisions and and come to conclusions. Um, what a GIS is fundamentally is the marriage of some sort of spatial data. So you've got a map um, and attribute data that goes along with that data that's connected to it somehow, which is our table here. Um, so you can see our map up above. This is our a GIS software package that we'll talk about in more depth later. Um, each of these polygons, each of these shapes that's associated with a geographic area is associated with some set of data. Um, and in the case of IUCN red list uh, maps, this is going to be a very structured table. Um, so really all you have to do is draw shapes on a map and fill out a data table. That's as simple as when, when really broken down, that's what we're doing in this uh, mapping species distributions. And that's what a GIS software package helps you do. Um, so there's no need to really be afraid of these software packages. You're really just linking a place and a location to some other form of data. Um, I need to give a brief note on projections because this is some an area where a lot of people um, run into some issues with when first starting to use GIS programs. Um, it's important to remember that maps are abstractions of reality, which represent a spherical object. So the, the Earth is roughly a sphere, um, and it needs to be represented on a flat surface. Uh, and, and we all are kind of familiar with these map uh, representations, and we're, we're, we understand projections in an intuitive sense. Um, but some of these have really specific consequences when performing calculations in a GIS package, um, which are important to keep in mind while you're making your maps. So different means of transforming data from a spherical to a flat surface result in different distortions, which must be considered when performing calculations. Uh, this is re very, very important when calculating extent of occurrence or area of occupancy. In these instances, the shape files you're working with must be reprojected into an equal area projection, or the calculations could be subject to considerable error. Um, GIS software packages won't warn you of this issue in most cases. So they anticipate that you understand how projections work and that you're using them effectively. Um, maps submitted to the Red List software in WGS 84, uh, which is the required standard for, for submission. Um, if you're performing calculations in a, an environment where you've got WGS 84 as your map projection, you can have some serious errors in your, your calculations. Um, so keep in mind that if you perform calculations using layers and different projections, you can also have calculations that, that don't work effectively. Um, so if your map layers are in different projections, they're not actually depicting the same thing. Even though on the screen you might see them overlaid effectively in, in the correct position, when you perform calculations on those maps, they won't produce the right answers. Um, and it may not warn you of, of that fact. Um, 
keep in mind that different map projections will preserve different elements of the map. Um, for our purposes, area is the most common and most important of these. Um, but you may also be uh, preserving things like the shape of, of an area, um, the distance between different points on the map, or the direction that um, a, a different map uh, emphasizes. So if, if, is north always up on your map, or does north change from up to left on your map, depending on where you are in, in that uh, depicted space? Um, so to elaborate on this a little bit, uh, equal area projections are, are really helpful when you're making uh, calculations for EOO or AOO in your red list assessments. Um, making your distribution maps uh, is, is a great time to make those calculations for EOO and AOO, um, and it's a great place to, to get that done. But you need to make sure that you're doing this in an equal area projection. Um, so distortions come in a few varieties. Uh, as you can see, that this map is quite distorted. We have the, the northern and southernmost parts of the Earth are flattened from north to south. Um, however, area is preserved. So if you take any particular region of this map, um, a given area will represent an actual uh, constant area, no matter where you place that shape on the map. Um, for your purposes, you may want to use a cylindrical equal area projection like the one depicted here. This is a great map, or this is a great projection to use for species with very broad distributions, because you can look at just about anywhere on the map um, and, and measure those distributions. Um, however, if you're measuring something at very high latitudes or you're mapping things at high latitudes, it might not be appropriate because the distortions that it makes are um, make it difficult to read the map while you're making it. Um, in those cases, if you're working, say, with polar regions, there are other maps that might be more appropriate. So conic projections like this one um, have a tendency to distort the direction more, which can make things a little bit difficult. Um, but most GIS packages have a wide variety of different conic, pack, uh, conic projections, and you'll find one that um, is adequate for the, the area that you're using, or that's the that's of interest to you. Um, there may also be some instances, and this is really, really important when, when thinking about GeoCat, um, which is a tool that a lot of people use for, for calculating EOO and AOO. Um, if your species distribution crosses over a pole or crosses over the international dateline, you can have some serious issues with when using these platforms like, um, like GeoCat online. Um, once they cross these barriers, the, uh, the species distribution um, EOO and AOO calculations get wildly off. Um, so you'll often end up with polygons that are oddly shaped that, that follow every area where the species doesn't occur rather than the species areas where the species does occur. Um, GIS software packages are, are equipped to handle this better than some of the online platforms, um, and it's important to recognize when you need to use them. Uh, so, for instance, there are some projections available like this one. Um, this is an azimuthal um, equal area projection that includes, it's centered on a point near Kiribati, which is displayed as a, as a um, complete circle around the edge of the map. Um, so if I were mapping a species with an Antarctic distribution, this would be a really good projection to use to make those EOO and AOO calculations um, because it depicts Antarctica, for instance, as, as a complete whole unit, um, and it doesn't cross over that pole. So if my species occurs in sort of a circumpolar distribution, um, this type of projection is going to help me make those calculations, uh, whereas a platform like GeoCat wouldn't. Um, this would be a very good map to use for a whole Arctic distribution as well, um, because I can go all the way around. If, however, you're mapping uh, a marine species that has a distribution in the Pacific, this would be a very poor choice because your, um, your calculation is going to uh, do an area right around the edge of the map, and it's not going to be um, correct. Uh, in this case, again, just explore the options that are available and keep in mind that equal, um, equal area projections are necessary for any kind of um, area calculation. Hey, Clay, before you move on, can we answer a couple questions in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the first one, there seems to be different versions of WGS 1984. For example, WGS 1984, EASE Grid Global. Each version results in different measurement calculations. Which projection is recommended? Um, so 
my recommendation first off is is not to do any calculations in WGS 84 because it's not going to be preserving any of the the values that you need. Um, WGS 84 does not uh, calculate distance correctly. It doesn't calculate area correctly. It doesn't calculate um, really any of the parameters that you would need um, to be measuring in a in a in an effective manner. Um, it's a great way of displaying data and it's a great way of of transmitting data because it's relatively compact um, and it covers the entire earth. Uh, however, um, it's not uh, it's not something that I would be using for calculations and I'm not surprised that you're going to get massively different answers using those two different unprojected um, coordinate reference systems. Uh, my suggestion is that you use a cylindrical equal area projection and anything that's got equal area in the title is going to be great for calculating areas. Um, if it's got equidistant in the title, it's going to be great for calculating distance. Um, these are these are the, the two most common ones that are important. Um, uh, and hopefully that answers your question. If not, um, you know, throw in some more clarification. Uh, we're also getting a question to define EOO and AOO. That's extent of occurrence, which is used for criterion B, and area of occupancy, which is also used as a, as a trigger for criterion B. Um, extent of occurrence we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in, in just a moment. Um, area of occupancy is simply the number of two by two kilometer grid cells um, that a species occupies, uh, and, and that's multiplied times four and gives you kind of the area that, that is actually occupied by the species. Okay, um, with that, I'm going to move on to some of the software packages that are available that you can use to make a map. Um, there's a wide variety of them that are available, and, and you'll find one that meets your expectations and your needs. Um, I have my preferences based on, on the, the availability that I have in my office, and they may be different for you. Um, so we'll go through a few packages and try to find one that, that might be right for you to use. By far, the most popular and the most common are Esri products, um, also referred to as ArcGIS. Uh, these are well-developed, stable platforms with numerous resources and training opportunities to support users. Um, but they're very expensive. So ArcGIS uh, licensing options range from a basic personal account, which runs about 100 US dollars annually, uh, to a fully functional business account, which runs into the thousands of dollars on an annual basis. Um, if you have access to the software, it might be a good choice. Um, if you don't and you're, you're contemplating purchasing it, um, I would caution you against that and recommend some other options, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the IUCN Red List has, has very little capacity to support licenses and does not generally issue them to specialist groups or assessors, um, so you're on the hook for the cost. Uh, however, many universities and other conservation-focused organizations maintain access to ESRI products and um, may be able to get you a license. Um, training programs are typically included with the purchase of license, so if you have access to the software, you almost certainly have access to ESRI's online training programs. Um, and you may want to seek some of those out on ESRI's website. Um, these often have interactive learning modules that walk you through a new, um, or walk you a new user through various basic processes, which is, can be very helpful. Um, the two main packages that ESRI offers are ArcGIS Desktop and ArcGIS Pro. Um, ArcGIS Desktop is a suite of software programs, including um, ArcMap and Arc Catalog. Um, and for the past 20 years, it's been kind of the industry standard. However, if you're new to GIS, I suggest um, skipping that and going straight to ArcGIS Pro. Um, despite the fact that the Red List unit has some well-developed tools for ArcMap, um, Esri will be phasing that out in the next five years, and we'll be all switching to ArcGIS Pro if we're using Esri products. Um, so if you're new to GIS, start with ArcGIS Pro. It's going to be easier to learn. Um, it's got all the same functionalities, and it's going to be more relevant further into the future. Um, both of these packages can be used to create maps. If you've got access to one or the other, by all means, learn how to use it. Um, uh, there's lots and lots of training videos available that will walk you through the individual processes for how to make a map. Um, and we'll get into some more terminology for, for how to seek out those resources in a bit. 
If you're not interested in paying thousands of dollars for a, a GIS package, there are plenty of options available um, for free. Uh, so these are open source plat software platforms that can be used. Um, they can perform all the same functions uh, that a proprietary package can. And in many cases, using one of these packages is maybe your best option, depending on your budget, your skill, um, and, and how much time you want to invest in the mapping process. Um, Google Earth is, is the most common of these. Google Earth Pro can be used to create polygons suitable for species mapping. Um, but the program lacks much of the useful functionality of other programs. It's not going to be great for making calculations. It's not going to be great for um, coding in your attribute tables for submission. You kind of have to find a, a halfway measure to do that. And on the Redless units end, they have to um, repackage those into a, a shape file that can be displayed on the website. Um, this is not a preferred option, but if it's what you have uh, available and you know how to use it and you're comfortable with it, it may be adequate for you. Um, it's also not possible to clip polygons to coastlines using uh, Google Earth Pro, which makes it really, really unsuited for species that occur near shorelines. Um, it, it's it's a, a possibility that you can use, and there are some basic tutorials available on the Redlist website for how to use this. Um, so I would encourage you, if you're going to use Google Earth, um, consult the Redlist website and you'll find a lot more resources there. Another option is GrassGIS. Um, GrassGIS is a fully functional GIS software package. Uh, it's, it's well developed. It's got a user interface that works really well. Um, Anna has just dropped in a link to some free training opportunities for Grass. Uh, there's, there's a lot of resources available that will walk you through how to use this software as a basic user. Um, it can be a little bit difficult for new users. Uh, I'm not terribly familiar how to, with how to use this, um, and it's a bit more technical than some of the other platforms. But if you're making lots of maps, doing lots of calculations, and doing things in a programmatic fashion, this might be a good option for you. Um, another possibility is what's called PostGIS. Uh, this is a, an extension of um, SQL-based uh, database software. Um, it integrates databases and may be a very good option if you have extremely large data sets. So these, um, these data sets will, uh, if, if you have millions of points that you're looking at across thousands of species and you have someone who um, has lots and lots of um, uh, experience using database software, this would be a great place to start um, to, to transition into a GIS framework for that. Um, it may require a lot of technical knowledge of, of how to use and write SQL statements. Um, so if you're not familiar with how to use it, uh, SQL programming languages, um, this is probably not a good option for you. Um, R, this is a, a question that we get a lot. Um, and and I've I received this question uh, from participants uh, several times, so I'd like to kind of address this in detail. Um, R is a statistical computing process or software that actually has some modules that will help it perform as a GIS. Um, it can be used for various GIS functions. Um, many packages have been developed specifically for use with the IUCN Redlist. Um, and to support red list assessments. This includes uh, packages called RED, CONR, R Red List, um, Red Lister, and RCAT. Um, and, and each of these packages can perform analyses that may be useful for you while writing an assessment. Um, it does require knowledge of the R coding language, and there's a very steep learning curve. So it may take a long time before you're ready to use this. And if you're not familiar with R, I suggest not using it. Um, you can, there's other ways to make your maps for um, red list assessments. One thing to note here is that there's no graphical interface, so you won't see a map until it's displayed. Um, if you need to make adjustments, you can't simply point and click and, and delete points. You have to go in through the code and manually tell the computer how, which points to delete or how to do that. Um, it's not user friendly, and if you're not familiar with R, don't start here. Um, one other question that we got is a, a um, the package con R has a mapping function that's uh, that's a lot of users are starting to use and um, a lot of people are inquiring about how to make maps with con R um, 
for the red list. And I'd like to dissuade you from doing that. Um, so it will output a shape file, but these are not well suited to making distribution maps. Um, so as an example, uh, on the screen now, you, you see a distribution for a plant species um, that was not made using CONAR. This is a, a map that I made based on um, literature and uh, reviews and uh, available point data and a variety of different sources in another software package. And this is what we consider to be accurate. This is what your map should look like for this species. It's native to a small portion of the southeastern United States with a few introduced populations along the northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico, depicted here in purple. Um, when mapped in Con R, uh, the species' distribution points, so I've fed in the, the herbarium data for the species into Con R, and this is the resulting map that it gave me. Um, you can see that a very different picture emerges. The pink polygon depicted here is the minimum convex hull used by Con R to calculate the extent of occurrence. You'll note that it includes, uh, includes large sections of the North Atlantic where there's no suitable habitat for the species. Um, in this case, the, the occurrences in Europe are cultivated. Um, the one in South America may be introduced. The ones on the west coast of, the, of North America are similarly introduced. And CONAR has made no distinction between them. Um, we could feed in slightly different data, but we're always going to get a minimum convex hull like this. Um, and it's perhaps not going to be suitable. Con R can also output subpopulations based on a buffer distance from data input points. Um, in this case, the orange data from Con R matches the species' distribution fairly well. You can see it overlaps. Um, but it's, there's still a number of problems with this map. Um, the buffer areas uh, introduce areas of open water along the coast um, for points that are near the, the ocean. Um, there's many erroneous records that are included, and there's no distinction made between native and introduced subpopulations. Um, there's not a really good way to do this in R, and this is sort of the best map you're ever going to get out of on R. Um, so it may still be possible to accurately screen data, clip to coastlines, and make a, an accurate map using Con R. Um, but uh, the lack of user interface will make this process really difficult for most people. Um, if you're not really, really familiar with how to do this already, it's not a good option and you should just try something else. Um, finally, QGIS. Uh, Use of QGIS has grown dramatically in recent years. Um, it has its own functional uh, platform with a, a graphic user interface that's very, very uh, intuitive. Um, there's a lot of training resources that are available. It's relatively simple to use. Uh, it has a lot of the same layout and functionality as ArcGIS Pro. So if you're familiar with how to use that, but you don't have a license at the moment, this is a great option for you. Um, it's free, it's open source. Um, the interface is significantly streamlined. That's actually a little bit faster to do a lot of things that you can do in, in Esri products. Uh, and it can be performed in, in fewer clicks using QGIS. Uh, there's plugins with the same tools that are currently available for ArcMap, but um, uh, these, are, these are not suited directly or, or not tooled directly for use for red list assessments. Um, and we're hoping that in the next couple of years, we can have those developed for QGIS as well as um, just as they are for ArcMap at, at the present. Um, these tools are relatively simple to produce, and, and I'm working with some students in the hopes of having these developed in the next year or so. Um, all right, uh, one last thing for, for base resources. Um, if you are making a map, a uh, great place to start is the IUCN Red List. Um, and there's a quick video here that shows you where to find some more resources that'll be very helpful. Um, if you have questions, this is a great place to start. This is where all the documentation is. Uh, it's on iucnredlist.org, the Red List website. If you go to the right side of the screen and click resources and publications, uh, it'll pop up with a variety of different options. Um, the mapping standards and data quality is up at the top. That's where you can find that document we've discussed numerous times. And way at the bottom, there's a section for spatial data and mapping resources. Um, in this GIS tools, software, and recommended base data, there's a lot of information that can be helpful. Um, it starts with the, the uh, IUCN Red List Toolbox for ArcMap, which has some really awesome plugins that'll help you calculate uh, extent of occurrence and area of occupancy with just a few clicks. 
There's an empty polygon uh, shapefile for your species. This includes all the attributes that are um, necessary for submission. So this is a really great place to start. Um, if you're making a new map, you can just open up one of these templates and it has all of the fields ready for you. And you basically just draw in your map and fill out the, um, the attribute table. Uh, there's also some base data with like coastlines, elevation data, bathymetry data, rivers, um, country boundaries that are standardized for submission to the Red List unit. Um, these are very helpful if you are uh, clipping, say, something to a country boundary and you're doing that numerous times. Um, it helps if everyone's using the same base shape file for what that country's boundaries are. Um, in that case, all of your maps will sort of line up and, and they, you won't have sort of ragged edges where species distributions don't match up. You'll also find um, shape files for hydro basins. These hydro basins uh, are used for freshwater mapping, which I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail in on in this webinar. Um, the freshwater mapping application link is also here. That's a really fully formed um, uh, website. Uh, it's a web-based application that will let you create um, freshwater uh, maps, uh, maps for freshwater species. Um, it's really, really helpful. Uh, it's simple. It's relatively intuitive to use. And I highly recommend starting with that one if you're making freshwater maps. Um, there's also a manual for the freshwater mapping uh, utility. Uh, links to the Esri website, links to some training for QGIS and um, R, various other tools that can be used for map making. Um, you'll also find maps, uh, links to the, the R packages that I discussed earlier, um, and some data providers down here at the bottom. Um, some of these have more or less utility depending on what your, um, uh, what your taxonomic focus is. So the Blue Habitats website is great for providing base shape files that have substrate information on um, marine environments. So if you're looking at a species that occurs in seagrass beds, that might be a great place to start to delimit just seagrass beds within the ocean, and, and you can limit those to specific depths as well. You may also have substrates like volcanic substrates underwater where this is useful or um, marine uh, coral reefs where, where we have very specific habitats that could be subset for your species of interest. Um, there's also links here to free GIS data. Uh, GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, it's a great resource for species um, distribution data in point format, um, and it's a great place to start when making your maps. Uh, there's also some, some more uh, tools on here. The, the WWF Conservation Science Data and Tools has some links to other data sets that may be of interest. Um, also keep in mind that GIS communities have, have a wealth of resources that are available out there that you could use for a lot of these. Um, getting a, a question here that says, what's the best projection in ArcGIS for a species that crosses the date line? Um, there's, uh, there's a conic um there's a uh, or a, a cylindrical projection that's centered on the international dateline and i don't know the name of it offhand um but it's something similar to cylindrical projection centered on the dateline um and that's the one that i would suggest uh there's uh, the cylindrical projections can really have a, a center point that that's anywhere on earth um and if you look around in an arcgis you'll find some that have very specific um uh points especially for the made for the pacific um and, and that's what i would recommend um one thing that can really help with that is just look for an equidistant or equal area projection and pull up the map and see where it's centered if it's centered in the pacific and you can see sort of your if you could make your whole map in that equal uh area projection without having it spill over uh, one of the edges then that's the map that you need um let's see uh would you still need to make sure to use an equal area projection in ArcGIS if you're using a tool which calculates geodesic area accounting for the projection rather than using planar distances. Um, there are some tools that that um, are available that will help with that so uh, and, and that will correct for that and take that into account, especially using ArcMap. Um, if you're using the IUCN Red List Toolbox, um, that tool will automatically perform those reprojections for you and figure out um, and, and make sure that those are done correctly. Um, I would caution you against relying on this heavily because unless you understand precisely how those tools are being run, 
um, it can be really easy to use a tool that's not quite set up in, in exactly the right way, um, and it can cause you a lot of problems. Um, the simplest answer is to just use an equal area projection whenever you're calculating our, um, areas, and at the very last second, you can convert that back to WGS84 for submission. Um, it's a really simple way of going about things. It keeps things simple, and it really um, removes a lot of possibilities for introduction of errors. Um, let's see, I've got another one here that says, um, what's, uh, what about using drone technology for mapping species distribution? Uh, this is well beyond my area of expertise. Uh, for a lot of species, that's going to be a great idea. Um, for, for a lot of others, uh, not so much. Um, I would consult with an expert on, on drone technology for that one. Um, I, I would like to give you a more comprehensive answer, but I don't really have one. Um, can the Red List website data be used in QGIS? Absolutely. So um, QGIS will open up shapefiles. This is something that, that used to be a proprietary software that only worked in Esri products, but now it works across many platforms. QGIS will open everything that you'll find on the Red List. Um, how do you calculate EOO when the minimum convex polygon includes non-suitable habitats and species that live in intermountain valleys, archipelagos, near shore islands, and continental lands? Um, you include all of those areas. So uh, I would consult the red list, um, uh, the, the red list categories and criteria manual discusses how to apply EOO and, uh, effectively. And there's more information in the red list um, guidelines for application document as well. So those guidelines are going to go in depth over where there are exceptions to using EOO and including the entire minimum convex polygon. Um, those exceptions are few and far between, and effectively, you just include everything in that polygon. Um, would GeoCAT generally be better for species with quite small ranges? Absolutely. Um, GeoCAT is a great resource for, for um, mapping EOO and, and calculating it without having to go through the, the hassle of using a GIS software package or worrying about projections and things like that. Um, I would suggest that you start with GeoCAT if your species is kind of up to the continental scale. Um, it's a really great way to map things, especially when they're very small. Um, once you get above the continental scale and you start looking at species that, say, have a, um, a distribution across the, you know, an equatorial region that spans the entire Earth, um, it starts to break down. Um, GeoCAT is going to be a great resource for any species that doesn't cover, you know, 80% of the Earth, doesn't cross one of the poles, or doesn't have a distribution that crosses one of the poles, and doesn't cross the international date line. Um, if you don't meet any of those criteria, uh, please use GeoCAT. It's a great way to calculate uh, extent of occurrence. If you do meet one of those require criteria, you may have to use some, some more advanced GIS software to get your EOL. Um, Carolyn's answering a question about EOO in the chat. I'll move on down a little bit further. Um, have you thought about incorporating ecological niche modeling in the elaboration of distribution maps? A lots of um, lots of specialist groups already do this. Um, so the the mapping standards that are given by the Red List unit are relatively vague, with the understanding that um, uh, prescriptive models for how to map species are not going to work for every group. Uh, so, for instance, a, a niche modeling um, uh, approach might be great for plants where we've got really good data on exactly where um, rainfall patterns occur and, and what temperature profiles are and where the species might have suitable habitat. Um, it may be a lot less useful for a species that occurs in um, like the abyssal plain of the oceans. Uh, we, we really have no idea what the niche modeling environment looks like down there, and so it's not a great way to go about these resources. What I would encourage is to make the maps as complex as they can be using the data that you've got. Um, so if you've got really good data on niche modeling for the species and you have a really good understanding of where it might occur based on some specific parameters, by all means, map it using those. Um, if you have a species of, of deep sea fish that has been captured three times throughout recorded human history um, and you know very little about its biology, you're going to have an entirely different mapping process. Um, and most things are going to fall somewhere between those two. Um, what about species distribution models for marine species to draw outer polygons? For example, uh, the use of RES in aquamaps. Um, so I'm not familiar with aquamaps, 
Um, what I will say is that a lot of marine distributions will use um, uh, will use what's called the shore fishes map. So if you contact the Marine Biodiversity Unit, this is something that will be going up on the Red List uh, Mapping Resources section. Um, there's a, a set polygon that goes out to a depth of 200 meters or 100 kilometers from shore that's, that's a buffered area. Um, and you can sort of clip this to the area where your species occurs. A really great way if you don't have a whole lot of information about a species biology to say we know that this species occurs near the shoreline we know that it's within this polygon um, we don't really know uh, more specifically than that so that's a really great way to use to sort of draw the the margins of a species range without having to go in and, and clip things and do all of these other um, more advanced features um, how can you if you have georeference data but haven't learned how to use how to produce a map, um, you may want to consult with your specialist group. Uh, they may have some resources. They may have some some members who are um, more familiar with mapping who can assist you with that. Um, that's going to vary dramatically based on on what you're mapping and where you're mapping it and who you're mapping it for. Um, my uh, there are quite a few GIS platforms that are relatively simple to use though. Um, and I would I would experiment with, you know, download QGIS and see if you can um, learn how to make a map. Uh, like I said, most of these, you, you can learn the basics of how to make a map in an afternoon without too much trouble. Um, and there's lots of information on, on how to use those um, sources. Um, through QGIS, we, uh, can we create maps that show different habitat types, say different types of vegetation structure, density for terrestrial habitats, any other recommendations would be great. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, QGIS will import both raster and vector data, which is going to be helpful for this. It's a matter of whether you can source the data that's necessary for your species. That's typically where um, things break down. Uh, is is it is it defensible to to come up with a distribution map that reflects um, the species distribution to the highest quality possible? given the data that we have. And again, in some cases, this is going to be absolutely possible. And you have this very granular data that you can use and, to, and manipulate in a variety of ways to come up with a very specific um, map. Uh, in other cases, that data won't be available. And in many cases, that process won't be necessary. Um, so again, we're making these field maps for some species. Um, we, we don't really have a great idea of where things are. Um, and we may want to just kind of have a generalized map that we know includes where the species occurs. Um, so uh, again, I would say if you're if you've got a wealth of data, um, you may want to consult with a GIS professional. Um, you may want to consult with someone who has a little bit more information on on how to use these, and they may be able to inform you on on how to um, make some of these more advanced maps. Uh, let's see, in my experience with the concave hull, in contrast to convex hull, uh, maps are better to create AOO maps. Why does the mapping standard not allow for concave hull maps? Um, concave, or, so concave hull maps are ones where we can, um, our angles can exceed 180 degrees between the points. And that may be useful for making a map purpose. Um, but when calculating extent of occurrence, we have to use minimum um, convex hulls. Uh, the concave hulls will make um, kind of inroads where we can have um, areas where the, the species, uh, it, rather than wrapping all the way around the species distribution, it'll wrap around all of the points individually and we can get more of a star shape rather than a circular shape. Um, in some cases, this is helpful when making your map. Um, but it's not useful for when calculating EOO, which is a very standardized measure of the, the distribution of risk to the species. So EOO is not intended to make a map. It's intended to reflect the, the odds that, say, a, a, a one threatening event could impact the entire population or some portion of it. Um, EOO is intended to me be a measure of the distribution of that spread and not necessarily be useful in creating your maps. Um, I'm going to I'm going to continue along a little bit and then we'll jump back into questions in just a moment. Um, so. All right, uh, given these base resources, I'm going to go through um, some data sources that you might want to use. Um, so the base data that was just presented on the IUCN Red List website, the hydro basins, coastlines, waterways, elevation and bathymetry, those can all be really useful and we recommend that you use them for all of your maps to be consistent. 
Um, hydro basins are used for freshwater mapping species, and they can be available at, at several different levels. So we recommend the HUC-8 is the, the standardized that's prescribed for your map submission. But you may want to use more coarse values like the HUC-6 to try to figure out where the species occurs within a watershed um, and maybe reflect some of the uncertainty that exists about where the species occurs. Um, so you can select all of the HUC-8 units within a HUC-6 unit. Um, and say that the species may occur there, and then the points where you, the, the HUC-8 units that actually contain a, a point that's verified can say that we can code the presence differently in those. Um, so these standard data sets can be really helpful um, regardless of what you're mapping, and I encourage you to go through and, and sort of see what's available, especially through the Redlist website for the standardized data. Um, point data can be accessed from GBIF, from museums, from your own personal data collection. Um, there's a million places where you might obtain this data. Um, be careful to, to um, take a look at the data when you first get it. Make sure that the projections that there or the coordinate reference system that the data is in um, matches your needs and it uh, make sure that you know how to transform that appropriately to get to the maps that you need to make. Um, Blue Habitats, we mentioned a bit ago, has um, some, some uh, habitat information for marine species. Uh, eco regions can be really helpful. Um, we, we really encourage people not to use eco region data um, and to rely on that very heavily in terms of, of mapping the species. We don't want you just pulling out an eco region that matches your species' basic habitat um, information. However, they can be really great in delineating where um, the margins of a species occurs. Uh, so eco regions, if you've got something that occurs in woodlands, you can really easily pull out woodlands from a particular area at, at a variety of scales that may or may not be appropriate to your map. Um, so again, whenever you're using these outside data sets, be careful um, and be cautious and, and be cognizant of what your map is intending to portray. Um, images is another great source. So you may have a book from the 1930s that has a really great paper map of exactly where the species occurs. Um, but obviously there's no digital copy of that because it doesn't exist. Um, in these cases, what you can do is scan those images and uh, go through a process called georectifying, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, which will help you warp that map into the projection that you're using uh, and trace it onto um, whatever, uh, on whatever area that area corresponds to. Um, and you can effectively digitize your maps in that manner. Um, data formatting tips. So follow the coding scheme outlined in the mapping standards document. That's going to give you really, really good information on exactly how to code in this data to make it um, compatible with other data sets and to make sure that it's displayed correctly on the Redlist website. Um, make sure that you fill out the necessary fields. So uh, this, the documents um, on the mapping standards goes over which fields are required and which ones are not. Make sure that those necessary fields are filled out. Um, this will really streamline the submission process and make sure that the Redless unit isn't scrambling to catch up with you. Um, clip coastlines where necessary. So um, we're going to go over what the clip function means. But basically, if your species occurs in marine environments, make sure that there aren't large land masses in the map that you submit, um, and vice versa for terrestrial species. Uh, file formats, um, submit shape files where possible. Uh, the Redlist unit can accept a variety of different file formats, including the, the exports from uh, Google Earth Pro, which are the KMZ uh, or KML files. Um, shape files are, are sort of the industry standard and the best where possible. And all of the software packages that I've discussed today are capable of exporting a shape file. Um, where possible, just use shape files. It's, it's usually the easiest way. Um, finding point data. So species occurrence data is available from a number of sources, herbaria, museum specimens, observational data, community science platforms. Um, and most of these platforms will export it in Darwin core format, which is a standardized spreadsheet you know, format that includes um, all of the, the data associated with that specimen. Um, However, this format's not compatible with submission for the red list. So you won't be able to directly take those point files and submit them to the red list because the tables are formatted differently. Um, however, there is a shortcut here that, that can be really helpful. If you're using GeoCat, this is the screen that you see when you first open it up. Um, and it'll ask you if you want to download species data. Um, once, you've, once you've got your data loaded, you can hit this little download data button and it'll bring up this menu. 
Um, when it asks you if you want to download the species data, you can download it as um, as a CSV, which will include various formats of whatever input uh, data came into that, whether it be GBIF or, or some other source. Um, you can also download it as an XML file, but if you choose this option on the right, um, it will actually recode most of those fields for you based on the best of its knowledge, and it'll produce a CSV point file that's already ready for submission to the red list. Um, so this is a great way to go through and make point files where necessary. Um, you can use GeoCat to um, cut out uh, individual points and, and remove points that you uh, know to be extraneous or, or that you don't want to include in your final map, um, the erroneous records and the like. Um, and you can very quickly reformat things for submission using SIS. Um, keep in mind that not all fields can be interpreted based on the underlying data. Um, I, I did some, some analyses uh, right here in, in New Mexico uh, uh, last week, um, downloaded some data and specifically told GBIF not to include fossil specimens. Um, but because these are not always included correctly, I ended up with a Tyrannosaurus in my data set. Um, this is the kind of thing that you have to be careful about and check. Um, so while these, these buttons uh, that'll, that'll automatically convert things can be really helpful, um, I still recommend that you go through and make sure that those, those data sets include the data that you want and exclude things that are already extinct. All right, um, importing point data. So most of the sources that we've talked about will export data in .csv tables. These are comma separated values. They're spreadsheets that you can open with Excel or any, any other spreadsheet software. Um, these tables can be imported into GIS software relatively easily, but most platforms require you to manually specify which columns to use for X direction and which to use for Y direction. Um, so when you import these tables, the software package doesn't know what your latitude and longitude uh, fields are. Keep in mind that this point data may be in a projection that's different from the one that you're using to make your map. Um, your data might be coded in UTM, and it might uh, those X and Y values might be in meters rather than latitude and longitude. Um, when you import your data, you'll, uh, regardless of what platform you're using, you'll find um, importing points will bring up some table that looks similar to this, a menu that's in some way similar to this, where you can specify where your point data is coming from, um, which delimiters are used. Uh, whether it's tabs or commas to say, you know, this is what's between these two fields and this is this indicates that this next bit of information is a new field. Um, you can also specify things like what the X file, you know, in this case, uh, X field, in this case, uh, the decimal longitude or the Y field, in this case, the decimal latitude. Um, it may be UTM coordinates or such, and we can specify the geometry of the, the coordinate reference system of the underlying file. Um, once you specify this, most of the GIS software packages will display your data on the map. Um, in some cases, the differences between coordinate reference systems are minimal. Um, so if you've got data that's in both NAD83 and WGS84, and it's coming out of GBIF, very, very common to see that where there's mixed data where some of it's in one projection and some of it's in another, or in one reference system in the, uh, or another. Um, in some cases, it's it's important to really understand what the differences are between those coordinate reference systems. In other cases, you don't have to worry about it as much. For instance, the difference between NAD83 and WGS84 is about a meter. Um, so any of those points will all be within about a meter of where they should be, regardless of whether they're coded as w, uh, WGS84 or NAD83. Um, in, in those cases, you can simply ignore it because a meter is far below the, the area of interest for most of our polygons. Um, it's not going to make a whole lot of a difference one way or the other whether your points are off by a meter. And the underlying data is almost certainly off by more than that anyway. Um, but I encourage you to investigate what the difference is between these coordinate reference systems before you make any of these assumptions. Um, and that, that's a very specific instance where it can be done. Um, and, and it may be uh, of interest to you when you're importing point data. Basic GIS tools and functions. So we're going to go over some terminology that will help you find the, the um, training programs that will help you make your maps. Um, so we're going to start with CLIP. Uh, CLIP is going to take an input, uh, some sort of uh, polygon or point data like you see on the left. Um, we're going to use a CLIP feature. It, that might be um, a country's boundaries. If we know the species only occurs in one country and not the neighboring countries, that might be a coastline. That might be um, any number of things. Um, 
And that clip feature is going to be used like a cookie cutter, and it's going to cut out our input file and result in um, just the areas that where those those two areas intersect. Um, in this case, uh, you can see the points. We've removed one of the points that falls outside of our clip feature. Uh, for our polygons, we've kept all of the polygons that were underlying, or or three of the four polygons that were underlying there. Um, but we've only included the areas where the two features intersect. Um, this is a really helpful one, especially for coastlines, um, and we really recommend that you use this when you have species that, that run up to a coast. Um, buffer. So buffers draw polygons a given distance from another feature. Buffering can be used for species um, known only from a type locality. We might only have a single point, um, and in that case, we might take a, a buffer distance that's relevant to the species' biology. Um, if it's a plant species that we know doesn't get around very much and there have been survey efforts in the, the nearby area that, that it, it's not there, we might use something like a kilometer. Um, if it's a bird, we might understand that the you know, birds are a little bit better at dispersing. Um, it might be migratory. We might have a lot of a number of other things going into this calculation, and therefore we might make the distances quite a bit further. Um, you might also consider it for uh, species that have linear habitats something like a, a species that occurs along a water course, um, but isn't strictly speaking a freshwater species, like a tree in a riparian forest. We might just buffer a, a, an individual water course by a mile or, or a kilometer or so, and then um, use that uh, buffered area to depict where the species occurs. Uh, it's also useful for species that occur along coastlines. Um, if you've got plants that grow in sand dunes, or if you've got fish that occur only in coastal waters, we might use a buffer to indicate, you know, the 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 distance where that species might be occurred uh, might occur from a coastline. Convex hull. Um, so these functions can be used to generate minimum convex polygons around your species' distribution. Uh, when performing these calculations, be sure to include only the appropriate areas, um, which might exclude some of the areas which are coded as possibly extinct or where presence is uncertain. Um, consult the mapping standards and guidelines for more information on which coded fields you should include and shouldn't include when you're calculating a convex hull. Uh, dissolve. Uh, dissolve is a function that allows the user to merge polygons within a map or create contiguous areas from overlapping polygons, um, and they can be set to merge only polygons that share certain attributes. So in this way, it's possible to merge all your polygons where the presence is coded as one, while keeping the polygons where the presence is coded as three as separate. Um, this is a really, really useful function when you're um, when you've got multiple different areas that you've mapped uh, that that can all be aggregated into one area. Um, especially if they have small areas of overlap, those areas will will be um, corrected in a topological sense. The smooth function may also be helpful. Uh, when drawing polygons, you'll be adding points manually. Often this makes a choppy or a regular shape with sort of points that may not reflect where the species actually occurs. It's a kind of extraneous data that's not correct. Um, the smooth tool can help you create a more natural look. Um, this can be done for aesthetic reasons. It could also be done simply for, um, you, you know, you have a couple points that you put that were not quite in the right area. Uh, smoothing it might remove that area and, and make it um, more appropriate. Um, when drawing polygons, uh, your map may only be as precise as the underlying data. So I'm going to harp on this uh, several more times today, that um, you may not have the data that's need necessary to make a map of a, of a given precision that you'd like, and that's okay. Um, we are going to make these maps based on the, the best available information, and sometimes that's not very good. Um, so we may end up with a species that we know occurs in the Atlantic Ocean, but we don't know precisely where, and our map is, you know, a large chunk of the Atlantic Ocean that we think the habitat would be suitable. What's really important is that we describe the map making process um, and include that in the appropriate field in SIS when submitting the map. Um, if you describe how you made your map, what elements went into it, um, what data you used for it, and, and you've been relatively comprehensive, even if your map is vague or even if your map doesn't fully have a, a lot of information underlying it, if it's the best information you've got, then it's a good map. Um, so so uh, it's also important to use the source field to cite sources for your data. Um, if you're using relying on multiple sources for, for data, um, you can source, you can uh, code that in in your attribute table for submission. 
and people can get a really good understanding of where the data came from for a particular feature within your map. All right, I'm going to go through a, a really quick sample mapping application. This is one that I did in QGIS. Um, this data is all fake. I've made it uh, fit really well, so your mileage may vary in terms of how um, how you go about making your first map. Um, so understand that this is sort of idealized in in certain respects, um, and it may be uh, you may have different parameters that are going into making your map. So the species that we're looking at here is a mouse which inhabits a high altitude meadows. Um, it's known from a single volcanic caldera and has not been observed anywhere else. Um, some point data is available depicted here in pink. Um, and you can see on our topographic map, we can see the volcano with our caldera. And we know from some source that it occurs in there. Um, in this case, uh, based on the information that we've been provided, we might want to just circle the entire caldera. So here you've seen, I, you can see I've made a polygon that goes around the edge of the caldera. We know that the species occurs in this area, and that might be as good as we can get. Um, uh, we then go on and uh, fill in the attribute table. So here I've got um, our, our scientific name. Uh, one quick note here is that the scientific name is what's used to map your species to your um, uh, assessment make sure that the scientific name is spelled correctly. Otherwise, you'll have a really hard time um, matching your attribute table and the, the geographic data that's associated with it with your assessment. Um, uh, we've then coded in the presence, origin, and seasonality fields. I've entered my name as the compiler. Um, the year compiled is, is when you made the map. Uh, our citation um, is the, the actual um, citation for the map. So in this case, it should be 2022 because it has to map our year compiled. Um, if you leave the citation field blank, it'll be simply uh, attributed to IUCN and whatever year it's published. Um, we may also fill out some of the uh, um, some of the map features that are uh, or attribute fields which are optional, including the source. We might fill out island fields, things like that. Um, Given that this species we know occurs only in meadows, we may also be able to narrow our habitat down further. So you can see our caldera still exists here behind this, this meadow or this, uh, this menu. Um, in this case, what I did was I, I looked up ecoregion data and I can find, you can see these lines um, showing the boundaries for the ecoregions. Um, this is, you can use whatever habitat data might be applicable or useful in your particular area of interest. Um, in this case, we can pull out where the grassland parks and meadows are. Um, I, I know that this area actually has grassland parks only in the areas depicted in this air in, in yellow here. Um, and in this instance, I can simply copy this polygon over um, and describe the process that I used for making this map um, along with my assessment. Um, let's see. In another example, uh, I've got a paper map. So in some cases, maps exist in image format, but we may not have access to the underlying digital data. In this case, I've got a paper map, but I don't have access to the data, and I don't know what coordinate reference system was used to make the map. Um, what I can do is import my map as, as just an image. Um, it has no associated geographic data associated with it. My GIS program doesn't know where to put it. Um, and what I can go through a process called georectifying. In this case, what I do is I'll choose points that are very discrete and can be located on both the map, the paper map, and the map in um, my software uh, that's that's georeferenced. Um, so in this case, I might choose uh, political boundaries where three places intersect. Um, that might be a great way for for finding a very um, a, a point that is known in space and time. Um, and I can I can add in these points, um, and what it'll do is warp the original map onto uh, our underlying map. And you can see it's kind of faint here down below, but there's a map underneath this that matches up fairly well with the coastlines here um, on both ends. But you'll note that out here on the very margins, it's not quite as good. Um, that's because the points that I've chosen are mostly up here. What we wanna do is disperse our points for georectifying as far around the margins of the map as possible. It's gonna give us the best results possible. Um, we might also use control points uh, like road intersections, political boundaries, river convergences, relatively confined points that are not going to move in space. Are they ideal? Um, 
once I've got this geo rectified and I've got my two maps to line up pretty well, um, I can then go on and basically trace the margins of where my species' habitat distribution occurs. You can see in this case, I've divided it into two different polygons based on whatever underlying parameter is on the other map. And you'll note that I've traced the boundaries on the inland very, very carefully, but out to sea, I didn't bother. Um, and that's because I'm going to use a clip feature here in just a moment. Um, once I, my boundaries have been drawn, I can use a coastline layer that I got from the IUCN Red List website, and I clip um, that removes all of these areas out to sea and leaves me with just the two polygons that I started with. It looks very similar to the map that we started with. Um, following that, I can then code in my attribute table for both of the polygons separately, um, including whatever uh, habitat information that I was going to use using to distinguish them. Um, it can be really helpful to make a workflow. So in this case, um, depending on the order that you're doing these operations, sometimes your maps won't make sense if you do them in one order, but they will make sense when you do them in another. Um, so for instance, when I'm doing my, uh, my clip function here, if I were going to, um, for instance, uh, smooth this polygon, I would want to do it at this step before I clip, because otherwise I'm going to smooth my coastline and then they're no longer going to match up. Um, so making these workflows can help you, especially when you're really early on in the map making process or, or you're new to it. Um, you can get a better understanding of how to do these things, put them in the order that you need to do them um, and, and do them relatively quickly. Um, so for instance, uh, for a given map for a hypothetical species, I might import a polygon template. This is um, the, the one that I get from the IUCN Red List. It's a blank species polygon that has the attribute table formatted correctly. Um, I might then georectify a map for region A. Uh, so I have a paper map that I can use that I can georectify that map. Um, I can then draw a polygon for region B based on habitat availability. So I, I have, for instance, um, I know that a species occurs on a particular island. I might just draw in that island separately from region A. Um, I might then smooth my polygons uh, and then clip to the coastline and then fill our attribute table and check that the shapefile meets the standards uh, outlined in the mapping standards document. Um, this is a really important step. The last step you should do is always to look at your attribute table, make sure it makes sense, have a glance at your map, make sure that it makes sense. Um, you can uh, display your maps in, you know, color coordinated however you need to so that you can make sure that everything is correct um, before you submit it. Um, and depending on whatever software package you're using, that's there's going to be various ways to do that, but all of them are going to allow you to display things based on some underlying attributes. Um, and you'll be able to effectively interpret your map very quickly, understand it and submit it. Um, also, uh, in this this checking of the shapefile meets standards, you may need to reproject your your um, map into a coordinate reference system so that it's ready for submission. All submissions to the Red List unit must be in WGS 84. So if you've made your maps in an uh, equal area projection, as we discussed earlier, um, great. That's a wonderful way to do all of your calculations and make sure that everything is in order. At the very last step, you can just reproject that into um, a, a WGS 84 projection for submission. Um, and that's going to get you uh, towards the end. With that, I think I'm going to open it up to questions again and see if anyone has any final questions. This is kind of most of the content that I wanted to go, to, wanted to go over this morning. Um, and if anyone has anything else, please drop it in the chat. Um, any, any technical questions we can address and try to figure out how to get you the resources that you need. Hey, there was one question earlier that you mostly answered, but maybe we should address it again. Do you have advice on how to clip shape files based on bathymetry or ele elevation? So that can get really complicated um, because bathymetry and elevation data is usually in raster format, which is oh, like a, a, a grid of cells, um, like an image file, like a JPEG or something like that. Um, and obviously those grid of cells don't match up with the shapes that we've drawn, which are in vector format. Um, so in a lot of instances, there are tools available to help you with this. If you're using ArcMap, the IUCN Red List Toolbox has a tool specifically designed to do this. Um, it can give you varying results depending on the scale of your map, um, because in some cases it's going to pull out 
literally little squares where um, the elevation isn't right. And so you'll get sort of a pixelated looking map out the end that might require a little bit of modification and, and um, editing to make it you know, ready for submission. Um, all of the software packages that I mentioned have ways that you can digitize raster uh, formats and, and turn them or vectorize raster formats and turn them into a vector that can then be clipped. Um, again, that's going to result in that same pixelation that's that's problematic. Um, one other option is to uh, display your raster along with the map that you're making. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll be you know, as a human, very good at picking out where these habitats are, and you may, um, as the assessor, have some information that's better than what the computer can do. Um, so in those cases, what you might want to do is display your raster format in um, in a scale that uh, that will show you kind of in a black and white image where the habitat is suitable and where it's not, and then you can use your judgment as the assessor to actually choose which areas um, you think are suitable and which areas aren't suitable. Um, so you may have habitat patches that are too small based on elevation, um, where the elevation is not suitable and, and suitable areas are probably too small to actually um, support populations. And, and you know that as the assessor um, from whatever knowledge of its biology. In such cases, you might be really well suited to, to use your eyes and, and um, select those large areas. There's a lot of tools that are available for this. Um, uh, there's also the possibility of converting your raster into a um, topographic map. Uh, so most of these GIS platforms that I've discussed have the capability of, um, of interpreting a raster surface as a topographic map, and it will draw contour lines on there for you. And then you can use those contour lines to actually clip your underlying map of your species. Um, note that that is really resource intensive, and it might take a long time. Um, it might be useful if you're mapping a lot of species in a particular area. Uh, you, you can do that. Um, keep in mind issues of scale. The finer you make those um, uh, the, those elevation gradients, if they're, say, one meter uh, resolution, it's going to take a very long time compared to if you use a 100 meter resolution. Um, so there's a number of ways that you can go about doing that. My suggestion would be to um, consider the amount of computational time that you need for this. If, if it's going to take you 10 minutes to make every one of your maps, um, fine, go ahead and do it. If it's going to take you two hours to make every one of your maps and you have a lot of maps to get through, you might want to consider um, those the, how time intensive each one will be. Um, got a couple questions. Uh, I still have and use ArcView 3.2. This has uh, had lots of helpful extensions. Um, does QGIS? Uh, yes, so QGIS has um, user generated packages. Um, there's lots and lots of extensions that are free uh, and available. Um, I highly recommend exploring it. If you're familiar with ArcView, um, then, then you'll pick it up pretty quickly. A lot of the terminology is shared. It's not that different. Um, and the latest iterations are relatively user friendly. Um, I would I would consider that and, and look at a lot of the extensions that exist. Um, User submitted stuff gets included in these, these packages all the time in QGIS, and it can be really, really helpful to use some of these. Um, so my suspicion is that in the next few years, assessors like yourselves who are really familiar with these packages are going to write their own packages, and you'll see those start to crop up in QGIS in the future. Um, I'm really excited about seeing those. I can't make them myself. I don't have the expertise, um, but I'd like to see more people make those. See, do I know if hydro basins or any other can differentiate freshwater underwater substrates, uh, sandy, rocky, flooded forest substrates? That is an excellent question. Um, that is a very good question. I, I, the hydro basins do not. So hydro basins um, are kind of a crude way of of presenting um, basically just drainage basins. And they don't take into account um, substrates at all. So an individual hydro basin will almost certainly contain all of the substrates that you're mentioning here. Um, I'm not aware of uh, of any particular um, underlying mapping software uh, data that can that can get you that information. However, if you're mapping a freshwater species, um, you map it using hydro basins anyway. So we're not actually going to submit a map that is uh, differentiating those sandy, rocky, and flooded forest substrates anyway, because our species is going to be mapped at the hydro basin level. Um, in such cases, you might want to make your own map, though, for 
calculating EOO or for some other purpose um, for for a good reason for that. And um, I good luck finding the data. That that seems like a really difficult one. Um, I'm not aware of any global data sets, but they may exist on a regional basis that could be helpful to you. Does QGIS work on a Mac? Mac, I believe it does. Um, I I know that there's a download for Mac software. I know it's possible to run QGIS on a Mac. Mac. Um, how can we easily check when the IUCN specific functions are available in QGIS? Um, uh, QGIS has a a uh, packages function um, that will show you exactly where uh, what packages are available. You can search for packages in it. Um, if there are uh, specific IUCN functional templates that are that are useful, um, I'll be sure to flag those, and we may include those in the GIS resources on the IUCN Redlist website. Um, those are those are my recommendations for now. Um, let's see, in the workflow, clipping appears after smoothing. Can you expand on why it's preferred over clipping and then smoothing? Um, that's a good question. So in this case, imagine a imagine a coastline where I've clipped out some sort of uh, convoluted shape on the um, the shoreline. Uh, maybe there's a fjord or something that has you know uh, inroads that go pretty far inland. If I smooth it after doing my clip function. What I'm going to do is um, edit that coastline, and it's going to smooth the coastline so that it no longer matches up with the actual coast. Um, so if I'm clipping to some feature that, that needs to be clipped, um, I want to do the smooth function first and then the clip so that my um, boundaries are going to conform to whatever feature that I'm clipping to. Um, also consider like a national boundary. I know that the species occurs in Pakistan, but I don't know that it occurs in India, or I know that it does not occur in India. Um, I might want to smooth that polygon before I clip India out of my um, my distribution field. Um, there's a number of other reasons why you might want to do this. So say you're using an eco region layer and you know that it, the species cannot occur in, in um, a wetland habitat. Uh, I might want to draw my polygon, smooth it, and then clip it to remove those wetland habitats. Um, in the freshwater mapping protocol, it states that if point data are available, a convex hull can be used, and if those are not available, hydro basins can be used. But the freshwater mapping application seems to do the second. Um, convex hulls are much easier if you have the point data. I, I agree. Um, so the mapping protocols should specify um, that you are map things to the hydro basin layer. So we, we don't submit convex hulls. Um, convex hulls might be used to uh, calculate EOO or, or to start making your map. Um, you might also be able to use convex hulls to specify which um, hydro basins occur if that's the appropriate thing to do for your particular species. Um, but I, I do not recommend submitting convex hulls, especially for freshwater species. If you have point data, it's actually really easy to use the freshwater mapping application to pull out individual um, uh, uh, individual hydro basins. Um, so the freshwater mapping application is is pretty well suited to taking your point data and selecting all of the um, hydro basins which have uh, a point within them. Um, it's it's pretty useful for that. Um, and it should give you results that are that are similarly appropriate to finding just like a convex hull in terms of the ease and the time required to make those maps. Got just a few more minutes, so if anyone has any additional questions, um, I'd be happy to weigh in on those. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, it's been really great to get so many questions and to get so much engagement. Um, and I really hope that we've answered your questions. Uh, if we haven't, um, I, this is a dangerous proposition, but feel free to email me and I can um, uh, see what I can do to, to help direct you to some resources that will help. Um, for national level species assessments, will species assessors need to produce a national map? Um, if so, will the national maps automatically update the overall species assessment map? Or does this have to be revised manually by the assessors? That's an excellent question. Um, that's going to depend entirely on how your national red listing process is being conducted. Um, so for some species, for some uh, organizations who are who are doing national maps in, in certain countries, um, they will have a whole process for submission. For others, um, it may all be done on paper maps. It's going to vary dramatically depending on who's running the national red list. And I can't give you any prescriptive information. 
What I can say is that it won't automatically update on the IUCN Red List website. So you won't see specific things. Um, uh, you, you won't see those pop up immediately on the Red List website, even when your national Red List is updated. Um, for uh, national Red Lists or regional Red Lists that are done in um, the SIS framework, that might actually happen and you'll see it, but they'll be separate. Um, all right, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Carolyn, who's going to have some announcements for our final webinar. Um, thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks very much, Clay. Um, that was a very insightful, very clear, very informative presentation. I learned quite a few things. I'm definitely not a map expert, but I learned quite a lot there. So thanks so much for that, Clay. And thanks to Anna as well for helping to answer the questions, especially all those technical questions I have no hope of answering, but um, thanks so much for keeping on top of that. Uh, thanks to New Mexico uh, Biopark Society for making these webinars possible. Um, Clay has been instrumental in just making sure that we get these webinars out. We've been talking about them for years now and now they're a reality and it's absolutely fantastic. And thanks to all of you for participating and asking so many questions. We've had 40 questions throughout that whole whole session and um, hopefully we've answered all of them to your um, to your satisfaction. If, as Clay said, if there's any more questions, you can contact Clay directly or you can contact the Red List unit as well. We have a GIS programme officer within the Red List unit who can help answer some of those burning questions. Um, this recording uh, of this webinar will be available on the Redless website within the next two weeks, as soon as I get around to putting it up online. Um, and the next webinar will be on the 16th and the 23rd of November. Um, and in this one, we will focus on the Species Information Service and how to make the best use of it. So SIS is the the database that is online and it's used by all of the SSC people um, involved in producing um, Red List assessments. It's the way you store, manage and submit assessments to the Red List unit. So um, we will have Craig Hilton Taylor and Janet Scott from the Red List unit will be telling you all about SIS and how to make best use of that. So um, that's all we have time for today. So, Thanks again to everyone for joining us and depending on where you are, have a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening or good night. Thanks very much.